Romans 8, I'm looking at 18. For I considered that the suffering of the present time are not worthy to compare with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Remember, we talked about, I, I guess this is my second lesson, isn't it? And that was my first one. Uh, the creation suffering in the, in the present time. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, futility, vanity is a good word. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, futility is actually better for this, for this text, but the, the Greek word means this as well as vanity. Not as its own will, not of its own will. What's he talking about? Creation. He's personified it, didn't he? He started that personification of it in verse 19, talking about anxious longing and waiting eagerly. And he's carried it over, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it in hope in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from the slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Notice its connection and uh, its freedom. Now, last night I, I, we talked about the word for last night. F-O-R, that it was uh, a conjunction. I, t I talk about it as a trailer hitch. It connects something to something. Well, look at this. This time, the word for is used in a series. It's a serial conjunction. So look at verse 18, for. That's, if you have a, if you have a Greek Bible with you or later take a look that's the word gar g-a-r it's a conjunction look at verse 19 for that same word gar look at verse 20 for gar and see the word hope how how is that ended is it a period a comma semicolon what's there um, verse 20, at the, after the word hope. What is that? Nothing. Yeah. Well, they, 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 they put that there, but there's nothing. In, in the Greek language, there's nothing. You just push on. Because remember that when this was originally written, it was not written with verses. Right? Well, it is, but it's not there in the original text. Mm -mm. Well, see, they didn't write verses in originally. They just wrote it like a letter. And, and it wasn't broken up here. So let's go back to verse 20. For the creation was subjected to fertility. futility. I can't get it out of my head, I guess. Uh, don't tell Jane what, what I got stuck on tonight, will you? Uh, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it in hope that. See, that's how that goes. It's not in hope. Mm. See? In hope that the creation itself also will be set free. See that? And that's the way it should be. Okay. That's the way it should be. Okay, let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into this passage. But I, what I was saying to you, that there's the conjunction gar is now as a, a serial. It's a marker that's like point A, point B, point C. But notice verse 19 and, and 21 are one, and I just showed that to you, didn't I? See? And so you have one, two, three. Three gars. See that? A, B, C. 
that's kind of interesting. Often you don't get a look like that, but that's called a serial conjunction. It's connecting important points, one right off the other and flowing. And of course, 18 is connected with the previous verse. And that's what starts the, the hitch. These are, these are hitches. They're hitch, hitching onto each other. This flows in and flows in and flows in and flows in. Yeah, it's just like the consecutive law in Hebrew. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Don. Now let's have a word of prayer. This is your opportunity as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit to make confession of sin if necessary because you can't study the Bible in carnality. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Spiritual means the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The carnal man can't understand it any more than the natural man can, but the spiritual man can understand every bit of it when he surrenders himself to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Identity of carnality in your life is personal sin. Could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, and avert sins, and they should be confessed in silence and privacy. For example, 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the procedure for Bible study etiquette, at least in this church. We would encourage you to do it so that you can get the maximum out of this hour of study under the ministry of the Holy Spirit because you can't get it out of, you're not going to get it in the flesh. And so, our Father, we thank you today for the privilege to have the freedom to assemble without censorship, except we place on ourselves. And I pray that would not be permitted because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit to teach us, to consolidate truth in our souls so that we can make decisions by it that brings our life into honoring the plan of God. We need to be always like the Lord, ahead of the game, not behind. Always playing catch up with confession of sin. Staying ahead of it by walking in the power of the spirit and not in the weakness of the flesh. Pray that tonight, Father, as we approach the study of creation and look at it once again from the eyes of God. For we've made our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Well. We're back into this series because we're not through with the 8th chapter of Romans yet. In this lesson, we're going to look at a difference. Here's what I run into in Christianity. They don't understand that what man has to be delivered from, is from as an unbeliever is not from personal sin. What he has to be delivered from is Adamic sin. I mean... You could tell this guy all day long not as an unbeliever not to commit sin. How's that going to happen? There's no power in his flesh. The only power he has in his flesh is willpower, and that's as that's as about as man, that ain't going to work. That's why God gave us the Holy Spirit. We live under the age of grace. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit that completes everything God wants completed in this dispensation. That's very important. So there's two things that people get, don't get straight. One is Adamic sin, the judicial charges of Adamic sin. They don't understand that. People go out and they try to convince people they ought to quit sinning so they could get saved. That's the craziest thing you ever heard. How are they going to do that? I mean, what sin are you talking about? You, you, I mean, what kind of sin are you talking about? I mean, Nicodemus, you know what the Lord told him? This man that was so powerful about the law and, you know, tiptoed through the tulips for God. He told him, you got to be born again. You got to be born again. So there's a, there, there's n the, the church today is not clear. I'm saying today because it's my day. They're not clear on Adamic sin is why we have to be saved. Romans, the fifth chapter, makes it very clear. 
Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so the sin death was passed up on passed upon all men for all have sinned. <laughs> the other thing that people are confused about are the curses associated with Adam's sin. So we're going to clear that up tonight in this study. At least for those of you that are interested and haven't cleared up. So we're going to look at the difference between the judicial charges of the Adam sin and the five curses that are associated with it that aren't connected with Adamic sin judgment, but rather the, the judgment that was extended by the curses. There are five curses, 13 judicial charges. On top of those, in association with that, comes five curses. And you've probably heard of them and just never connected them. So we're going to, we're go, that's one of the things we're going to clear up today. And then the other thing we're going to clear up because what my passage is interested is one of those five curses. And so we're going to talk about that. All right, so point number one. Our lesson will focus on creation subjected to futility. Of the ground or the earth. That's that's what we have. Uh, described in verses 18 through 21. Creation subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him, God, who subjected it in hope, which means confident expectation based on the promise that God has made you. That's hope. That it would be set free. What is going to be set free? Creation is going to be set free from the corruption. That's the curse. And it's going to, and, and like its curse, its freedom is associated with man and Adam's sin. Do you understand that? Well, you will before the night's over, I hope. So what I did is I took verse 20 and 21 and I broke it down into three sections, A, B, and C. So we could get a look, a good look at it. It says, for the creation was subjected. That's hupotasso, and that's very important when it says subjected. That's hupotasso. That means submission. Hupotasso. It's a present middle indicative to futility. Now, here's the point that's not on your paper unless you write it. Point A. <clears throat> The creation was placed under a system for the creation was subjected shows that creation was originally placed under a system of rank and authority because hupotasso is one of those words that refer to uh, rank and authority, being under rank and authority, which means there's a chain of command. Hupotasso is a word that says you're under rank and authority which means there's a chain of command. And whatever the top of the command says runs all the way through and it holds everybody accountable under it. it holds everybody all the way down, all the way from the top five, four or five star general all the way down to the PFC. For the creation was subjected, the word hupotasso means that creation originally was placed under a system of rank and authority with a chain of command. And that's why the word futility comes into place. Somebody in that system of rank and authority broke it. <clears throat> and the result of that was futility. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing <clears throat> is not of its own will, but because of him. Now, we're talking about language of accommodation in theology. Talking about the earth is being per personified. The ground or the earth is being personified. <clears throat> not of its own will, but, see the word not and but? Not of its own will, but 
because of him, God, who subjected the original creator, who subjected it, who putasso, in hope, and then it goes on to another idea, right? I mean, hope is now explained. He stops with hope, pounds that out, and then says, this is what I mean. Now, point number B on my paper would be creation didn't cause it, didn't cause futility, right? We saw that, not of its own will. Creation did not create futility. Who did? God. God did it because there was a violation within the rank and authority system. Right? Now, we know because we've read chapter 5 that that was Adam. Okay? He's already explained that to us, and now he's, he's talking about the aftermath. But here's what I love about God. He did it and attached a promise to it. In your worst day of relationship with God, he always, and he disciplines, he always brings a promise of hope. Isn't that wonderful? Promised hope. Let me think. Let me tell you how 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 important this is. Take David, Bathsheba, Nathan, the prophet comes in. The national prophet comes in and says, "You're a cook goose. You're a cook goose. You broke a chain of command that's that's capital punishment, and is God's going to do it." You're going to die a sinner to death, right? You know the story. Second Samuel. Here's what can be done. You confess your sin and we'll see God where God's going to take you with that. Because if you confess it, it brings you back into fellowship with God. For first John 1 5. And you're back in the game with hope. Confident expectation of what God will promise you after you re he restores you. And if you know anything about the story, then he goes on to tell David what's going to happen. And how, and how this whole thing can be salvaged by the grace of God. Isn't that wonderful? That's what we're talking about here. Listen, that's open to your life. This is what it means to be a child of God. This is what it means to walk in, the, in his ways and talk in his ways and Follow his ways because they're beneficial to your life and time and eternity. <laughs> Confident expectation, the word hope. He ends this subject with hope. Hope for what? Creation. And remember, it didn't do it to itself. Right? It didn't create this. If you're going to be a science scientist someday in your life, be a good one. And I don't mean a good one by because you got a bunch of degrees from gobbledygook. Be a good one that understands original causes and sources. Because creation did not create the mess it's in. You understand? It didn't do it to itself. It was done to him like it was done to you. Right? Adam. Here's the third thing. In hope that, and it means deo, deo t, deo de, is a, it's a compound word with dia and hote. And it means because of this, you got hope. There is hope in spite of your messing it up or having someone else mess it up for you and, and you're stuck in it. You see it with children all the time coming out of abusive relationships or wives coming out of abusive relationship or, 
or, or even sons coming out of abusive relationship. Doesn't always have to be girls. So here's my point. Here's what it says. And hope that the creation itself also will be set free. That, that whole word hope doesn't mean I hope it happens. It means there's confident expectation it will. It's a promise. There's a better day coming. That the creation itself also be set free from its slavery to corruption. That's futility in description. Into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about resurrection. It's going to be an Easter morning for the, for the earth as well as for you and I. Up from the grave business. He's talking about resurrection. It's a marvelous thing. Look at, if you got your book open to Romans yet, yeah, look at verse 23 and I don't know if this is on your paper, but it should be. Probably not because it's on mine, uh, handwritten. You know, we ended with, uh, uh, but I'm looking at 23. And not only, look at verse 22. He, he goes on, he says, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Then he says, and not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly, same idea that the earth is, waiting eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. See, he goes on to explain that. And he's using the same terminology uh, that we could understand this in a, in a bigger picture, into a bigger picture. Um, by the way, you, if you wrote Romans 3.23 on your paper, then you might write Ephesians 4.30. If you didn't, well, it won't matter. Now, what is interesting is the Greek word for futility. I wrote it on your paper. The word to is a definite article, the. Mateotes. Mateotes is an interesting word. It's often used in the Greek language, and it means emptiness. It also is translated vanity. But emptiness is an interesting, and this always refers this way, and context determines what the emptiness is about. So context is important. Vines and I like vines because he always gives simple common sense definitions of Greek stuff. Vine says that mateotis means emptiness, listen to me, this is important, as to results. In other words, something you, you had, at one time you had full, you were full of it. And something occurred in your life to empty it. And you, you lost the results you no longer full. You lost what you were full of. Now, sometimes that might be good, but this is a negative idea. It's a negative idea. Emptiness. Emptiness uh, with results. The emptiness with results. Um. You see it with people who once were on fire for God. They loved him. They honored him. They studied him. They did this and that. They go into carnality. They go into reversionism. You couldn't get them to have a prayer out of their life. When you say to that person who comes to you and they, <laughs> you say to them, well, let's have a word of prayer. You pray and I'll close. There's no way they could get a prayer out. That person you used to pray with, he could pray paint off a wall. I mean, could pray and get, get answers. That person is empty. You say to him, pray. He, he cannot do it. He just sits and cries. I was with a guy the other day. He just sat and cried. I said, well, God, God probably hears you, but I don't know. I, mean, I thought this was going to be a joint deal here. <laughs> I Listen. I don't know what that means. I mean, it must mean maybe it means something to God. 
I mean, you must be talking with him, but look, at some point, just interject a little point with me, or if you're through crying and praying, that's okay with me. Just say amen, and then I'll close. And finally, we got to amen. Man, I don't want to make, how do I know whether he's praying to God? He's weeping, but how do I know he's praying? But you, you could have got a prayer out of him. You know what I mean? He couldn't verbalize it. And when we got through, he, me, he struggled to say amen. Emptiness of results. There once, once you were filled with them, and now you have none. You're empty. Your tank is empty. You had gas, and now you don't have any. Your tank is empty. How, how far are you going to go on an empty tank of gas? Not far. Not unless it happened on the hill. <laughs> then we got, we can coast for a while. That's what most people do. And then they have to face reality again, don't they? Hope I'm talking to somebody. In context, we're talking about creation. Don't forget to what we're talking about. In context, it refers to the emptiness of creation in regard to its original divine creative purpose. It is no longer functioning the way it was created in Genesis 1, 3 through 31. Something happened in the order of rank and authority that caused God to intervene and put it under a curse. Think about that. And that curse is not going to be relieved, uh, lifted from creation until the resurrection of the last believer. You know when that's going to be? Millennium. It's going to get some reproval. It's, some of this is going to be reversed. I showed you that the other day. Some of it's going to be reversed during the millennium but won't be totally right. And I showed you the snake was still crawling out his belly business, but it's not going to be totally be relieved until the last of the believers are resurrected. We, we call that the order of the first resurrection in eschatology. And a good read for you sometime, you go like, ah, I know all about the, the creation, but probably if you go to this church, you do because they teach it every year. When you read Genesis 1, 3, where you pick up the order of creation, day 1, day 2, day 3, day 4, and you get to day 6, please go to the second chapter, verse 1. Here's what it says. We go through the six days. It's good. Everything's good. Yeah, it's, it's everything. Day 1, it's good, you know, day 2, it's not good. Day 3 is good, day 4, good, 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 good. And we get all the way through the sixth day. Thus the, listen to this, thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts. See that word completed? Everything is under divine order, under divine, the rank and authority has established everything. Are you with me? Everything by, the, by God, everything is perfect in completion. Are you with me? And yet something happened. Something happened with man and something happened with earth and that is connected to them, is connected to them in Christ. Do you understand that? I said, listen, Paul said, it, it, the, it, earth is under it until the resurrection. The or, until the last of the resurrection. There, there's, a, there's an order of the first resurrection. That's the resurrection of believers. The church goes, then the, the Jewish dispensation goes, then the millennial go, and then we're done. Anyhow. To those visiting with me on the internet, and you go like, you have to understand, I'm talking to people in my congregation right now that have heard this over 40 years. <laughs> so we can talk a lot between the lines to you. So you need to go back to our internet and pick up speed if you want to know because I'm talking to people who maybe you're a new believer coming into us 
in comparison, these are people who are in their master's and doctorate level of information. Listen, you can get there. We didn't get there in one day, nor in one Bible study. So let me encourage you. If you go like, I have, he's saying, he's saying so much. He's talking about the first sentence. He's talking about the rest of the I don't know. Uh, it's okay. This, listen, we all started where you are. If you're faithful, you get where we are. It's okay. Just study with me for a year. Study with me for a year. If, you're, if you pick me up on Tuesday night, stay with me with Tuesday night for a year. Gary just came out of the prison of the year. You weren't with guys that were in for a year, were you? No. They were in for a long time. Well, anyhow. The, the, so we've been talking about the Greek word uh, mateotes. So what happened to cause creation to become subjected to futility or emptiness? And why is it why is its freedom attached to the freedom of the glory of the children of God? Do you see there's connection? Do you not see that? The theological answer to cause creation to become subjected to futility and why it is the theological answer to the scientific origin question is to understand divine original causes. For example, the original causes connected to this lesson come from Adam's original sin and the five curses associated with it. Thirteen judicial charges of Adam's sin and five curses associated with it. Point number two. For example, Adam's original sin, AOS on your paper. It's important to understand the difference between Adam's original sin, we call a, a, just abbreviate, AOS, and the five curses associated with it. Adam's original sin resulted from Adam violating Genesis 2.17, don't eat from the tree the day in which you eat, die, and you will die. That's in Genesis, that's in Genesis 2.17. In Genesis 3.6, he eats. 9 through 12, we have the re results of it. In Romans 5.12, through 21, there, if Paul goes into a, an, an enormous discussion about this, which is important to chapter 8. Wherefore is by one man Adam business. You, you, you have that. How, people say to me, well, how do you know it's Adam? Because in verse 14, he says Adam. In Romans 5, 14, he says Adam. That's how I know. I know it also from 1 Corinthians 15, 22. In 1 Corinthians 15, 2, it says, In Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. I know it that way as well. So, you see, what, what's missing with a lot of, e even in a lot of theology, what's, what's absolutely missing in science and in much theology is the original cause. I mean, wh why are we born as sinner? I mean, why are we born as spiritually dead and under s sin? Who sinned? See, Adam sinned. The 13 judicial charges you can study in the pamphlet called 50 Things. Let me go to the five curses because you're probably more. You know the five. Listen, 13 curses. Alienated from God. Uh, spiritually blind. Uh, cursed and condemned. Darkness and death. Enmity. Natural man. Perishing. Sinner. Ungodly. Under the wrath. You know that. Listen, it has nothing to do with how you behave. It's you're born this way. And you have to be born again to get out of it. But anyhow, uh, my subject here is not that tonight. My subject is the five curses. There are five curses associated with Adam's original sin. And it was because of participation in it. Listen to me now. This is important, either directly or indirectly. Three of them are direct and two are indirect. So... Go to your Bibles, because this, this we got to get. Genesis, the third chapter, starting with verse 13, where he begins this. Do 
you know, he starts way up there. Adam is sent, he's hiding. You remember that? And he says, who told you? He said, why are you hiding? Because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat? The man said, oh, the woman you gave me, she, she gave it to me and I ate. All right? Blame game. There you go. Now, verse 13. Then the Lord said, now you see, that, that, that's Adam's sin business. Then he, th now here's what's attached to it, the curses. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent. It's the serpent's fault. So the Lord is, has to sort all this out now, right, for them. Not, not that he has to sort it out for himself. He has to sort it out for them. Because God is always ahead of where we're, okay. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent. And the Lord said to the serpent, here's where it starts. Because you have done this, that's participating in the fall of Adam, Cursed, that's Ara. Now, this is really important, and they underlined it. This is an Ara curse, and, it, and it's given to the serpent. Cursed are you more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go dust, you shall eat all the days of your life. And you remember that was one thing. That, that guy is still doing that in the millennium. Remember, I, we talked about that last time. Verse 15 is indirect, and that's to Satan, who was behind the whole deal with the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head. You shall bruise him on the heel. That was to Satan. We call that the first gospel. That's called proto-evangelism in theology. Romans 16, 20 tells you that. Uh, Revelation, the 12th chapter, verse 9, and Revelation, the 20th chapter, verse 2. Did I put that in your paper over there by Satan? I did. Also, you can study this, and we will, when we get to Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 9 to 14. All right? Now, you see, the serpent was directly, Satan was indirectly, and got them both. Right? Got them both. All right? Then he goes to the woman in verse 16. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband. He shall rule over you. There's no curse there. Watch that now. Do you see a curse there? Well, now he's going to address the Adam. Look at verse 17. Do you see the word curse underlined? You know what that is? That's Ira. Now, let me tell you. The serpent's cursed directly. Satan's Ira cursed indirectly. The woman is not cursed. Not cursed. And not only that, hers is temporary. And it's conditional based on what two things? Come on. What two things is she? Childbirth? And marriage. Not true of the rest. All right? You understand that, don't you? Okay. Okay. Pain and childbirth makes it clear. Pain and childbirth. In pain you'll bring children, and your desire shall be your husband, and he shall rule over you. Okay. And that's part of that chain of command business. All right? Now, to the woman, she participated. It's a direct. But look, at it was an hour. Isn't that interesting? It ought to be to every woman in here and to every woman who's born. She's born under Adam's sin, but not under the curse. You understand that? Even though she is included in the curse section, isn't she? But he makes it very clear that he didn't pronounce an hour curse on her. Agreed? Because he's, he's, he's pulling them out and hitting them. It's not like, oh, he forgot. Right? Now, verse 17, verse 17, the man, Adam, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from, and, and eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground. 
because of you. You shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Where is the hour cursed? He's, he's saying it to the man, right? But the hour curse went to what? The ground. The ground. Because Adam has already been judged for his sin. And, this, and it's tra it's a, the curse goes to the ground from which he came and to which he lives on and to which he will return. Right? right. He came from it, Genesis 2, 7, from, right? Created out of the dust, the body. God breathed Nishima Haim in it, the breath of lives. He lives on the earth. He came from the earth. He lives on the earth, and he returns to the earth. Cursed. Right? Cursed is the ground. Cursed is the ground. And what did the ground have to do? Well, thorns and thistles, it will grow, right? You will really struggle, but so will it, right? The earth will struggle. To provide you a living because from it you've come and you live and you die. And so, I mean, I think about it every time there's a birth and every time there's a death. I think about this. Every time I go out to a funeral and they put somebody open the ground and put them down in it, I go like, wow. Two people crying here today, the family and the earth. That's, that's how I think. Two people crying. Right? The earth is crying because it can't wait till there can be a resurrection. Everybody comes in, nobody comes out. Wow, when are they going to come out so I can get relief? Right? As a principle. That our curse is directed to the ground. Because of Adam's sin, we have now the curses. And while the curse is not directly assigned to Adam or Eve, it is because of that act that we've got all of this engagement. Now, you think this might be important if you as a scientist and you were dealing with Earth? Or space travel? I mean, you know, it's still part of the heavens and the Earth, don't we? Do you think this? See, nobody, nobody, every, science, listen, I don't fault them because their job is to, is to not interpret. Their job is to observe. They never talk. They, 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 listen, observation will never lead you to original causes unless you study the Bible. Because you're limited in what you observe and what you observe, they have named. They've given the best names they could give to what they've observed, and they've been correct names. Point three says, Science observes the curses and gives them names like second law of thermodynamics and entropy. Yeah, entropy. Like Adam. Adam, you know, what was Adam? Adam's first assigned job from God was to name everything. We still go by it. We still call it day one with day two, day three. We still call it an elephant or a dog or a cat or a flower or a rose or a pet, whatever. We still, we still use those names. Every time I meet a, a person that wants to be wants to challenge me, I, I just tell them what day of the week it is, and I said, "Listen, the argument's over. Today is Monday. Where did Monday come from? What do you mean, where did Monday come from?" And I said, "You do know Monday's not the first day of the week, don't you?" They don't, because they go to work on Monday. They think Monday is the first day of the week. They don't, they don't study original causes. 
And that's okay because their job is to be an observer. But original causes. Adam, Adam was an observer, and out of observation, like a scientist, he named all, everything that had been created. He named it. God said, I want you to name everything. Uh, let's name everything. But you know what he assigned him to? Original cause. I mean, Adam understood the original cause. We don't because, listen, you, you got to listen to the voice of God to get it. You have to listen to the voice of God. Science can calculate, for example, science, science can calculate life expectancy. I talked about it the other day. 76 for a man and 81 for a woman. They can calculate that. I mean, it's just a math question. But they can't cal calculate how they should live on earth. They can't calculate what happens to man after he dies. They can't calculate where death came from. Tell you the truth, they can't even calculate where life comes from because they think it's the birth canal. That's the best they can do with it. No, I mean, where does life come from? <laughs> where does it come from? <laughs> and where does it go? Where does that life go that person had when he dies? Where does that where does that life go? It goes back to the one who gave life. It's not earthly. It's heavenly. Nishima Haim. He, he, he created the body out of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils. Nishima Haim, the breath of lives. And when you die, the, it goes back to the one that it came from. It is a gift. So every time you take a deep breath, you smell the roses. The reason you can smell is because God gave it to you and because you have a rose is because he gave it to you. That's in 1 Peter 1, 24 through 25. Do you know what connection a flower and a man has? A human being, I don't mean just a man. You know what a flower and a human being have together? Well, they're both created good. But in that 1 Peter 1, 24, 25, it tells you. What happens to the flower when it reaches? It goes through the, 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 you know, the same law that everything else, right? It goes through and what does it do? It withers and dies. It withers and dies. It withers and dies. Hello? And w w they're both attached to something. That concept of wither and die, the second law of thermodynamics and ent entropy, they, they're both identified with something. And listen to me, it's Adam's sin. I gave you, I gave you several, you know, the, the earth is, is running down. The amount of available energy is constantly decreasing. But listen, all the writers tell us the same thing, but God remains the same. Can you remember that? Can you remember, listen, with a, well, you know, if the earth is, it's going to, it's going to, we're going to, uh, forget it. God, listen, it's still running off. You know who controls it? That same master planner, that same head guy over the creational system. The Godhead is still in charge of this whole business. It ain't going to happen. You know why? Because God set all this in motion. It's going to run out just like it says it's going to. Because God set it in motion and God hasn't changed. Everything else is constantly changing. You do know that. I love this. People miss this little phrase, but in Hebrews 1, 10 through 12, when you read that the next time, pay attention to this little phrase, in the beginning. That's the way the Bible opens. That's the way John opens his lessons. In the beginning. 
You know where that, you know where beginnings come from? You know what the original cause of beginnings are? God. Did you know you had a beginning? Do you know you get a, a, there is a new creation that you can, no matter what age you are, you can step into the plan of God into what's called the new creation and have a new beginning? I don't care if you're 80 years old. I don't care if you're 15 to, or 12. You Listen, you have a one beginning. You that's, that's the original creation story. You can have be part of a new creation by the new birth. Whew, uh, what a wonderful message that was to my soul. God remains the same. In, in Hebrews 1, 10 through 12, in Psalms 102, 25, 27, in Isaiah 51, 6, where there's eschatology taught, and then in the common sense of 1 Peter 1, 24, 25, where it compares the flower and human life, the commonality they have, and the hope they have. They both have the same hope. The flower that withers and the old man that withers, they, they both wither and die, and they have something in common, the resurrection, the resurrection of the believer is going to remove the curse from the earth. And so we have looked at creation subjected to futility. I want to bring it personal to you in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. I want to bring it down to your life because there's connection, right? You're connected with, with the earth, okay, as humans. Therefore, do not lose heart. You ever known anybody that has lost heart with their life? Sad, isn't it? It's probably the saddest thing. And it's very difficult to get them out of it once they get into that funky idea. It's hard to get them out. Therefore, do not lose heart. Though you're outward, outwardly where we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed. See, that's the new creation, being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. See the hardships you go through. They're just building you a future that you don't realize. They're building you a future. Everybody's involved in retirement and building up a nest egg and all that. Listen, you need to be thinking that way spiritually. See what he's telling you? That far outweighs all the troubles. So fix your eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So don't let your hearts get troubled with all this stuff. It's just life. God is greater than life. God is greater than life. Today, all of creation is under the sovereign control of the Lord Jesus Christ, seated at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven. You know who that is? That's your mediator. That's your Savior. That's your Lord. Listen, you talk about name dropping. There's a name to drop. I mean, he's in control of this whole shooting match. You can read about this in First. In John 1, 1 through 3, Colossians 1, 15 through 17, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, Hebrews 2nd chapter 9 through 10, and one of my favorite, Ephesians 1, 4. Because once again, God brings us full circle. Just as he chose us in him, Christ, before the foundation of the world, before creation, that we would be holy and blameless before God. I mean, you can't do that apart from Christ. But in Christ, you can have that complete. Jesus has the divine authority to overrule fixed laws of creation. That's why we pray. That's why we pray. There's a good reason for you to pray. It's on your paper. Jesus has the divine authority to overrule Fixed laws of creation. We saw him do it on earth, didn't we? Still has that power. That's why we ask him. 
We ask him according to his will. We ask according to his will. Prayer is a very powerful thing because we have somebody that has in the, in the system of the chain of command is now at the top because of the cross. Victory in the cross. In Colossians 1.17, he is before all things and in him all things are held together and he uses it in the perfect tense. That's a done deal, baby. That is a done deal. Listen to me, so you don't get crazy when you listen to all these goofy scientists. This is why available energy will never reach zero in the present world, because he said it wouldn't. You understand that? Because we have this hope, right, that's been established in our text. That the creation itself also will be set free. This is that hope that the creation itself will be set free from a slavery to corruption into the freedom, the glory of the children of God. Listen, listen to how that's connected to us in Galatians 5.1. Listen to this. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. The, and the creation wants it, eagerly awaits it, just like you and I. Sure. Uh, could be. He gave her pain. He gave her pain. And listen, he even gives her an out on it. I mean, well, you talk about a gentleman. He gives her pain. You know, you know what he gives her? Uh, a reprieve on pain? John 16, 21. Right? Right? You know what he, gave, what he does? Every woman ought to know this. The joy of birth. The joy of birth. You, you can get that out of a man. He, he give one baby, they say, that baby's done. This is, uh, they'll never be, they'll never be two. Listen, listen, I've seen, listen, if you've ever had, the worst thing a guy can get is what? Kidney stones. He, and he has them one time. He's not going to have a house full of them. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to have a house full of those, baby. No. Well, let's have prayer. Father, we're so thankful for your love and mercy and grace. We're thankful, Father, that we have the ability to look at the scriptures and study them uh, under a doctrinal concept that we can look at the different pieces and put them together. And in this study, Father, we see what we're, what we're living. We see the flower, the beautiful flower reaches its creative potential and then begins to wither and then dies. But for us, we're born again. And while that, wither, while that flower withers on the outside, it's as strong and vital to the original origin of creation better than it's ever been. Oh, I mean, that is out of sight. And Father, I couldn't tell you. I mean, I, when I try to wrap my brain around that, this little old boy from Podunk, Michigan, that's a, that's a pretty big task. I just know that that's an, a wonderful concept that I grasp, that I can be, while the outside is fading away, the inside is growing and 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 is renewed every day, renewed into the original origin of what man should be. Oh, God. <laughs> you're, you're a wonderful, wonderful designer, and may we always trust you with it, with our life. In Jesus' name, amen.